in the U24 in the previous campaign uh, with Christy, uh, Sam, and, uh, and Jamie. So I've been a coach for 16 years now. I've coached golf, badminton, volleyball, ice hockey, and ultimate. I've coached multiple national teams in different sports. Uh, I do have a lot of experience, but I don't know everything, and I do make a lot of mistakes. Okay. So I'm going to share a few points, and at, at the end, there's going to be a question and answer uh, period also. So one of the, the challenge is considering long campaign versus a short campaign. Last time when we had the U24, we had 15 months to prepare. This time we have six months. If you're playing in a, in a club, your goal might be to qualify your team to go to world in four years, or it might be the upcoming AUC in, in six months. So there are different, different goals, uh, and sometimes those uh, objective have to be approached differently. So just a few things. You can see that some of them are really important and they're on both sides. Uh, set a culture, set a vision for your team. This is important no matter if you're looking at a six months, a two day, a five hour uh, period. You need to have a culture. That culture needs to be not just decided by one individual, but by the team. And this. There has to be healthy communication uh, about it. Uh, it's important to work on fundamentals, whichever sport you're doing, and you will have time to do so, whether it's a short period or a long period. Okay? Uh, especially if we look in ultimate, we're looking at the success rate in, let's say, in pros. Nobody will ever get to 100%. Okay? So you can always work on this. There's always room for, uh, for improvement. Uh, However, you do have to acknowledge that the improvement done over 15 months and the improvement done over six months might not be the same. Okay, so as coaches, if I apply this to a U24 experience uh, campaign, if we look at this campaign versus the previous one, if we're just talking about Germany, we're not talking about the National Youth Program, if we're just talking about, about Germany, it's in six months, so we need the players to be at a certain level, where in the previous campaign, we believe that we had time to bring players to a certain level. Okay, so that is one of the difference. So regarding uh, what your goal is and how long that goal uh, is set to be, then that's gonna affect your improvement period. Uh, build foundation and less time for new boundaries. One, so when you have uh, a short campaign, you have less time to work on, on boundaries. What I mean by boundaries is testing your limit. There are other throws than flick and back end. Okay? If you're not comfortable with the other range of throws, in a short campaign, you might not have time to work on those. Okay? Uh, just to link it on pushing boundaries, the case of the 18 months. Uh, some of you might have been around, Dan Rule came uh, three years ago. Three years ago. Dan Rule is a well-established coach in Australia, and he came here to give clinics. And he was talking about the 18-month boundary, where if you learn for the first time a throw today, then it will be final, universe ready in 18 months. From now. If you learn to do uh, a flick scuba between the leg today. <laughs> you might not be ready to try it at a tournament. You might not be ready to try it at the final. You might not be try, uh, ready to try it in universe. So when we're talking about the, the case of 18 months is how long it takes for you to be comfortable with whatever skill you're working on, okay? And this is not a time that we have for Germany, okay? So it's just, we have to be careful on how we approach and how we push boundaries. And this is true for any team you're in. If your goal is to be somewhere in three years, right now you're a cutter and you want to try as a handler, yes, you definitely have time and go for it. The team might need that. But if it's in a month, 
then you want maybe to work, put your energy somewhere else. Uh, the time to work on fitness, obviously whether it's a short or long period, you have time to work on fitness. The problem with a long campaign, as was mentioned previously, is you can be 100% for 12 months a year, five years in a row. That is impossible. You're working through a cycle. As a manager, I could talk to you about the sine function and all of those cycles, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but just to say that you need to be aware of those cycles and you need to be aware when to peak. If it's a six month campaign, the easy part is that you have to go now. And you don't have to worry about when to peak. You know when you're peaking, it's in six months. We have six months to build that program. So in that sense, it could be easier. But if you're working on a two year plan or a 15 month plan, we can look at the, the previous campaign. Some players started hard right at the beginning and then halfway through, it was mentally challenging. But everybody had to be peaking in the, uh, at Perth. Okay, so this is something to take into account as well. Okay, common misconception. How can I learn from this player? I'm already better than he is. Okay. Uh, your player, your coach, your assistant coach, somebody who's giving you a pointer, does not have to be the best player. There are tons of examples of, uh, on that, but I can use Brian Jones as sort of the, the trendy example. If you've, if you've watched uh, USA Ultimate, if you've watched the, uh, their national championship, Pony, the team from New York, won. With some of the best players, some of the more established players, both players, uh, Miko, Junior Miko, uh, and yet they were coached by a player, sorry, not a player, they were coached by someone who, if he would try out in a club team in Malaysia, according to himself, might not even make, be able to make the team. Not, not very fit, maybe not necessarily have the, a range of throws that is required, but it doesn't matter. What you need as a coach is to, you need to be, you're also a psychologist, you need to be able to, you're a communicator, you need to communicate with your players. You need to know the needs of your players, you need to know a lot about strategies, you need to be able to decode other teams' strategy in a short, uh, short time. And if, you're, if you can all put this together and communicate all of this to your team, then you can do something that will work well. Okay? Yes, there are some disadvantage. If I'm giving a clinic to 12 year old that want to learn how to do a 60 yard hammer and I can't do it, it might be difficult for me to show that. I, I give you that. When you get to a certain level, like the campaign that we have, that we're starting today. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, our job, coaches, is much more than showing you those skills. <coughs> oh, sorry, just to go back on Brian Jones. Brian Jones was able to get the key players on board and sell his ideas, show that he, he could get the respect deserved from his, his, his star players, that everybody would be on board. And that's the key here, okay? It doesn't matter how good, how bad you are, you need, you need to show to your players how good you can be, and you need to be able to, to have them believe in you. If your players don't believe in you, don't believe in the coaching staff, then it's not going to work. The key, is not to be the best player, but the key is to be self-aware, okay? Uh, self-awareness is what will make one of the biggest difference between an average coach and an elite level coach. If you're self-aware of what you can bring to a team and what your limitations are, then you can surround yourself with the right people, the right team, to complement each other. Too often, it's the opposite. Too often, like-minded set paired together, and that creates sort of one identity, 
with many weaknesses because we don't complement each other. We just have the same strength. What we need to do is exactly the opposite. Okay? What you have this weekend is 12 coaches. 12 coaches that have a wide variety of <coughs> strengths and weaknesses, but with all our strength together, I, I think everything is covered. Okay? Not everybody will know the answer to everything, but with those 12, I can tell you, you're in good hands. You're in great hands. Uh, players learn when failing, so coach has to be able to create a safe failing environment. That is psychology. If you do a drill that is easy for you, even the, if the coach asks you to do uh, to keep doing it, there's no learning happening. It's easy for you. You're this is you're not you're losing your focus. If you're failing. The challenge is that it's a safe environment. If you're failing badly, then there's no learning also because you're just so upset, so frustrated, uh, it affects your morale. But if the coach can create sort of a challenging environment where, yes, sometimes you will succeed, but a lot of times it will be challenging and you might fail, well, at least you are going to think about it you're going to try to get better at it, uh, and you're not going to be uh, filling yourself with negative thoughts because you're still yourself in that safe, safe environment. Yeah. One thing I've always said, uh, maybe some of you know, maybe you don't, but I'm also a teacher, uh, and I've always said that to my student, if you're not ready to fail, you're not ready to learn. Okay, if we if we try to eye that side and always show our good side, show what we're good at, then you're not getting better. Okay, if you have an amazing flick and you just do flick, you're not your back end is not getting better. Okay, you have to be willing to take that risk. You have to be <coughs> ready to make mistake in order for you to get to the next step. Uh, tough decision will have to be taken uh, along the way. This is based on your goal. There was a clip, I wish I, uh, I would have been able to find it, I can't find it, but it's a clip on the AUDL. And the clip <coughs> sort of shows one player after the next, and they just quickly uh, blur out something that they've missed because of training. I've missed baptism, I've missed graduation, I've missed a wedding. And it just keeps on going faster and faster. Just to show that you need to make sacrifice. Okay? So sometimes if you have a family dinner that's on Saturday, and it's just a regular family dinner, family dinner sometimes if you you're really want to make that U2014, maybe sometimes you have to sort of bite a bullet and say, I need this. I need to be at that training. This is how I'm going to get that. Okay, so you need to make that decision along the way. Hmm. How to get your message across a Star Wars story. This is just my own personal analogy of the dark side versus the light side. <laughs> okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you're familiar, Star Wars is a movie. Uh, there's multiple. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, the dark side is often sold as sort of the quicker side. Sort of that negative energy, we're going to push you, uh, we're going we're gonna to fill you with negative thoughts, but then you're going to be so strong. <coughs> but we know, if we watch the movies, spoiler alert, <laughs> the lighter side, the side will rise above. Okay, so it's not just about that building yourself into that negativity but it's also trying to be able to have that positive uh, message and build from that. Sometimes we're having a tough day, we're at, at practice, but if you always need that coach or that teammate to say, come on, wake up right now, you're not having it. And keep pushing and keep grinding, and you keep going with what I call the negative talks, 
negative message, and what's going to happen when that person is not there? Okay, you need to find that you need to find that uh, energy in you to be able to push yourself to be disciplined and to achieve your goal. Okay. On and off season was talked uh, by a great woman named Chrissy Hunter. Uh, crucial to have an off season to avoid being at eighty percent all year. We have you can say we have the advantage of having a full year season. 12 months, uh, but if you do that, if you try to perform to be at your top all year, it's only going to be, your, you're going to get 80% all year. Nobody can peak, nobody can be at their peak all year long. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Okay, we did this last year. How many of you currently have a long-term injury that you just play through? Hands up. You just have like a little niggly leg, your knee, you have to wrap something, you always wrap your ankle. Nice to have you. You're under 24! You're so young! How are you so injured? Okay, last time we did this, 80% of the room put their hands up. This is to avoid that. Heal up faster so you can be peaking. Please, please, please. That is actually a better statistic than last time. Though. Last time your lot were like nearly 100%. Thank you. Uh, but players say they want to keep playing, so what do you do when you have your player? You're coaching a team that you want to call an off-season, okay, uh, we just add national, let's restart in two months time, three months time, uh, but players want to keep playing. <coughs> what you should do is encourage them to play other sports. You are developing other skills when you play other sports, okay? But at the very least, and coaches, this is also for you, Players need that break mentally. So if somehow you can stop them from playing ultimate, okay? <laughs> you as a coach, even if you're around, you have to stop coaching them. They're going to pick up and they're trying some random stuff, let them do it, okay? You are not coaching anymore, okay? So that at least they're not burning themselves mentally. Okay, so if they wanna keep playing, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's the physical aspect, they're responsible for it, but at least you as a coach control part of the mental aspect. Let them, let them go. Okay. Coach's responsibility to give, to give every chance uh, to a player to flourish, okay? If a player, this weekend is an example, if a player says to us, I don't want to be a handler, and you keep evaluating them as a handler, and they turn out not to make the team, that doesn't mean anything about their cutting. Okay? Give them a chance to succeed. Give them a chance to show you what they got. So it is your responsibility as your coach to put your player in that kind of environment where they can do well. Okay? A player's responsibility to work on his or uh, her confidence level. This is also a team effort, but at the end of the day, players need to get, to find a method, often on their own, to increase that confidence level. The coach's job is to give all the chances you got, but at the end of the, at the, end of the day, if the player does not believe in himself or herself, how is the coach supposed to put you in? Okay, so again, give that chance to the player, to get as good as possible. But players, it is your responsibility to work on your confidence level. Fine line between confident and uh, being arrogant. It's important that you're confident in your skills. At any level, in any sports, when you see a 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old player making it big, if, if you see a 20 player making it to the English Premier League, they have that confidence. That is one of the major uh, aspects. Players need that confidence. If you look at any sport, there is no reason why a 30, 32 year old player is better than a 22 or 24 who is supposedly, supposedly uh, in better shape 
uh, probably faster, more energy, needs less time for recuperation. So if you have, as a younger player, if you have all of those advantages on your side, there is no reason why you get beaten by an older player. And, but often it has to do only with the, the confidence level. Knowing the system, being confident with it, and sometimes it's just intimidation. The number of time I've been to pick up here where I see a younger player who doesn't want to mark a certain established player just because they don't have the confidence. And then I look at those players, you're faster, you're more agile, you have better throws. What is stopping you from marking this player? Okay, so you need to trust yourself, you need to work on your confidence, but you cannot be arrogant. Okay? Arrogant actually shows that you lack confidence. If you're just saying you're the best because you want you want people to believe it, you don't have that confidence. You're just being arrogant. Okay, so there is a fine line between uh, between the two. I'm just going to show you a click a quick clip on uh, body language. Some of you might have seen that clip. Can we turn? Oh. So recruiting kids that are like really upbeat, loving life, love the game, have this tremendous appreciation for when their teammates do something well, that's hard, that's hard, it's really hard. So on our team, we, me, <coughs> the staff, we put a huge premium on body language. And if your body language is bad, you will never get anything. Ever. I don't, I don't care how good you are. If somebody says, well, you know, you just benched Stewie for, you know, 35 minutes in the Memphis game a couple years ago. Yeah, I did. Oh, that was the motivator for the South Carolina game the following Monday. No, it wasn't. Stewie was acting like a 12 year old. So I put her on the bench and said, sit there. It doesn't matter on her team. And the other coaches might say, well, you can do that because you got three other ones. You know, all Americans. I get that. I understand that. But I'd rather lose than watch kids play the way some kids play. I'd rather lose. And they're allowed to get away with just whatever. And they're always thinking about themselves. Me, 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 me. I didn't score, so why should I be happy? I'm not getting enough minutes. Why should I be happy? That's the world that we live in today, unfortunately. And kids. Check the scoreboard sometimes because they're going to be yelled at by the parents if they don't score enough points. Don't get me started. So when I when I look at my team, they know this. When I watch game film, I'm checking what's going on on the bench. If somebody's asleep over there, somebody doesn't care, somebody's not engaged in the game, they will never get in the game. Ever. And they know that. They know I'm not kidding. Okay, so body language is important. As a coach, you're supposed to gauge your team. You're supposed to see the, the pulse of your team. You can look at the, the body language. If a player is sort of just sitting on the side, not caring because they've been sitting for three points, why would you be tempted to use that player? Okay, so body language is really important. It is for you, it is for the coaches, it is for your teammate. Okay, so, but it falls on players' uh, responsibility. 
Uh, attention span. Nowadays, after five minutes, often players lose focus on the drill. So coaches need to come up with 16 drills when they could just have two and that would be fine. So it is your responsibility to work on that, to work on your attention span. To go see a movie and not be on your phone at the same time, but to watch the actual movie. To go to dinner and talk to the person that you're with rather than text somebody else. Attention span is crucial. Make sure you enjoy the ride. I've talked to many players about this. If for whatever reason you're training for the big campaign, a big tournament, and you can't make it there, or you don't get selected, at least if you enjoy the ride, if you enjoy the time in between, you got something out of it. If you're suffering through this for just for the end goal, you don't know what's going to happen. You might not be, you might not be, uh, you might not play. You might be injured. Whatever it is. Okay, so at least if you enjoy the ride, you will get something out of it. Uh, it's important, obviously, to be disciplined and to get uncomfortable. Okay, try something that is outside of your boundary. Uh, coaches rule. Leave room for players to grow. You will see we have two modes here in U24 and uh, other clubs try that. We have a stretch mode and accountability mode. Stretch mode, it's for you to try something. You want to try that big long throw, you want to try that, that super break throw, go ahead. On stretch mode, no evaluation, no players will ever be cut on stretch mode. And then you have accountability mode where we want to see, where coaches want to see how you can do those simple things well. That is your accountability. Uh, important to plant seeds here and there. If you try to show a skill and you're only going to move to the next drill when your success rate is 90%, you're going to do two drills during the season. You need to show different drills, plant the seed, and then players will slowly get better at all of those, and then you have yourself a team. Uh, create challenges for your players, but make sure to stick to them. If you say, we're going to do this drill, until we get 30, 30 consecutive throws. If, if you set this, and after two hours you still haven't succeeded, just keep going. You have set that, that goal. Otherwise, you're sending the wrong message. <coughs> but at the same time, it is your resp responsibility to set goals that are achievable. Uh, coaching is like parenting. Some challenging will have to be faced by the players only. It doesn't matter. How well we prepare you, there are some challenges that we know are coming. And there's nothing we can do about it. We're going to prepare you as much as you can, but you're the one that will have to face that on your own. Uh, minimizing negativity. I just brought that point uh, from a video that some of you might have seen it, uh, might have seen from the Fury coach. Basically talking about line calling. And if every, every time you have, let's say, a line of 10 players, and you take seven, you're always turning down three players, then they start questioning themselves. If you have eight players on that line, you're turning down one player. That player is leaving the line, going back to the bench, thinking, why not me? <coughs> Instead, if you have three lines of seven and you keep a rotation, uh, that might min uh, minimize that negative. This is for another talk, but I just wanted to add it there. Uh, work out. We talked about working out. It's important. There's no one size fits all, though. You have to be careful. I see teams getting in bulk, and let's say we're getting 15 together, and we're going to train. Not everybody needs the same thing. I am not your age. I don't need the same thing that you, you do. I need to maintain. You need to get stronger. My training program is different than yours. So if, yes, it is really important to train, but be aware that in that group, we don't have the same goal. So if you could get a time where, yes, the team uh, work out together, but you have more uh, isolated individualistic drill, rather than all doing the same thing, it might work to your own advantage. So you, I'm just saying you have to be careful with that. I'm not an expert, but I can certainly, I certainly know that I don't need the same training that you do. Right? 
Uh, and then deep down, what is the ultimate? Deep down, what's the ultimate goal? Is it to train as a team, to have an activity as a team, or that your player train? I don't have the answer. This is for you to think about. And just quickly, I'm going to skip that because we're running out of time. Uh, choosing players refer to your goal, short term, long term. Are you building for the future? Do you need something that happened now? Do you win? You need to win this weekend's tournament, or you need to win something in, in two years? Uh, are you looking for friends, or you're looking for athletes? Are you looking for raw talent, somebody who has the potential now, maybe not ready, uh, or are you looking for a security? Sometimes it's a mix. Again, I'm, ju I'm just throwing out a question for you to consider. Uh, and the danger of last minute pickup, what, are, what message are you saying to your team? Your team might be uh, in agreement with it, maybe not, but you have to take, uh, think that, uh, consider that uh, carefully. Are you going to have the last minute pickup or not? We're going to pass this one. Uh, just to give you a brief idea, for a quick idea for U24 for the last two minutes. Uh, it's important to strain your foundation. foundation. We are part of this. Uh, to create our own culture, what we had in the previous campaign. Commitment, be ready. If it is going to be stronger, spirit, be better. Missing a T there, a better. <laughs> Uh, encourage communication, discussion. Okay, so it's important. You need to communicate. It's not one group. A lot of uh, organization work, work with a hierarchy. Let's break that. Work together. Communicate. Uh, understand the strength of uh, weaknesses of each strategy. So if we show you a bunch of strategies, it's also important for us to show you the strength and weaknesses of strategies so that when you play against a team, you know what uh, what to expect. Develop a new wave of players who would be the future leader. We have them here. We have 10, 12 players, uh, returning players from the past U24 who are here this weekend to help you. Uh, and to prepare players for the international scene. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm running out of time, but is there a quickly good question? 